I should tell you about Android. Android is, Android is an operating system that was developed by Google. It is essentially built, it's a Java engine that is essentially built around Linux. <clears throat> if you go to the command line, you get Linux, you can see what kernel you've got. Um, there are some Linux utilities that you can use. But it's basically a Java-based graphical installation. Um, it generally was designed to run on smartphones like the Motorola or Atrix that I have or around uh, other smartphones. Uh, the original intent was not to run tablets, but uh, one of the really, really nice things about the Android is from a development standpoint, and I'm not a heavy developer on the Android, but I played around a little bit. A lot of the things that you do as a developer in the Android is you specify things as relative. So that when you when you hold your phone up vertically and then you switch it to horizontal, uh, the perspectives work correctly and mine's not going that way. Anyway. But uh, also, one of the biggest differences between Android and Apple's iOS is that the Android operating system works with many, many different screen sizes. You know, every phone manufacturer has their own different, there's no standardization for screen size in the, in the uh, smartphone market. You know, Apple has their size. Um, all the different manufacturers have different screen sizes and you, you pay for the extra real estate and stuff like that. Android works very nice for that. Unfortunately, it does not work for the <coughs> visually impaired, so it's not a good operating system for that. Lance, you want to answer that? No, he's not. He's like <laughs> talking that it was not really good for the visually impaired. It's not only people here. Yeah, in the uh, visually impaired room, hearing. So the, the basic thing with the Android is it competes with Apple's iPhone operating system or iOS. Um, and it, again, the nice thing about it is that from a developer standpoint, you set things up as relative. So that when you set up an icon, it looks normal regardless of the screen size and things like that. Uh, works very nicely that way. Um, Android also there's Brian. Android also tends to you know it, it works pretty well. It, it, the earlier versions of Android were a little clunky. Um, you know, compared to the iPhone. But right now, they essentially hold the lion's share of the market. Um, but it's a, it's a graphical operating system based on iPhones. Are you shaking your head? Did I say something wrong? Lion's share of the market? What? It, lion's share of which market? The mobile. The mobile uh, phone the market. Apple for Smart tablet. Smartphone. Smartphone. Smartphone market. Well, they I don't think that's true. That's yeah. not true. Smartphone, tablet, yes. Yeah. They have tablet. They no, actually, actually, I think it's true. Mm -hmm. they, they, Android has, when you add up all the hardware devices that run on Android, it's like 40% of the market, smartphone market. Yeah. So they actually have more share than iPhone. Yeah, who, who are those figures from? 
Bloomberg News. I mean, it's, yeah, it's true. It's, it's surprising, but it's true. Now, it's because there's well, so, so many one, one of the important things to make sure you're doing is measuring apples to apples, and yeah. uh, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and typically, Android handset manufacturers have only been quoting shipment figures, not sales figures, which well, is an entirely different thing. That's product into the pipe, not product out of the pipe into consumers' hands. Okay. There was 500,000 activations per day worldwide. Um, that was since May at Google I.O. Um, Apple at Worldwide Developer Conference said somewhere between 400 and 450,000 activations. So okay, so that's run rate. That's run rate. And if you just so who started first? Well, Apple, but they it's a fair comment. It's, it's not really relevant. Though. I mean, it's just that yeah. the, the, the surprise, the, the shockingly surprising thing, is that there are so many Android uh, smartphones out there. I, I think it, it's not whether Apple <coughs> is sold out more or <coughs> Android devices. Well, it's just that the, the rapid adoption of it. So I, I own one, and I'm an Android developer. I just don't right. believe it to be a true statement. So. Well, okay, and I, sure. I would like a, a citation for it, because so, it would be <laughs> great evidence. We can get you a citation. But, okay, but cool. there's actually a separate issue that you're probably addressing, which is that who's making more money, oh. um, Android developers or Apple developers? And I think <laughs> the average Android developer would uh, say that the average Apple developer is making more money. So those are actually two really separate uh, issues. <coughs> and and, uh, and that's good. I, I mean, I would assert that the average Apple uh, iPhone developer is <coughs> making more money than the average Android And Apple's margins on the hardware are reportedly actually more than on Android. Yeah, and, uh, it, yeah, so in terms of total money made based on um, Android versus iPhone, no doubt about it. I mean, you know, Apple is is doing great. So, and Jerry's probably going to get into this, but the, the, uh, the whole Motorola thing, I mean, it's, it's all about the ecosystem and what, you know, Google's motivations are in terms of how they make money is, I mean, only Google knows, but, uh, but the economics are I think the, the main point is that there are lots of Android devices out there. Uh, it is some of the fractious market. Who's making the money? Great question. It seems like iPhone developers are making the money based upon just the iPhone 11. So we could get you a site on the numbers. But it actually was recently, past week, in the I, Yeah, I just searched it. So. I'm pretty sure it was yesterday in the Wall Street Journal because of Motorola. Numbers they had were 48% Android. 18% Apple, 10% uh, Blackberry. This is tablets or smartphones? These were smartphones. Ta Apple has about um, 75 to 80% of the tablet market. Um, they got the iPod too, right? So well, Android is three times the uh, Apple market? Uh, two and a half. Five and a half. Two and a half. And they've gone into about 50 devices shipping it. But I'm trying to find the article so I can see what the numbers are that you were asking. If the if it's in the last journal, I can find it. I might get it. Yeah, it's hard to get the it's hard to get the the real numbers too. But um, the basic thing is, <coughs> Android is an operating system that is similar to the iPhone in its capabilities. Uh, it's, it's graphical oriented primarily. Uh, when, I, when I said my part, I wasn't asking you to dumb anything down. Just, yeah. I mean, I've you know, done OS work, I've worked on a inside of JVM. I'm, I, like I say, I'm doing a comment, just a little, like when you talk about gingerbread. I don't, right. I don't know what gingerbread refers to. Okay. That's the sort of thing I'm talking about. Uh, it's an OS version. Okay. Like OS many OS other OS vendors, uh, they Rather, than they code name their versions of the operating system. Uh, Froyo is um, 2.3. They're all designed to spread on the player. Froyo, gingerbread, ice cream sandwich. Okay. Nerd. Anyway, I haven't kept track of the code names all that much. But. Uh, um, I upgraded to gingerbread on here, and I, I like gingerbread a lot more than Froyo, which was better than the original thing I had on uh, my uh, back foot. Is it a is the bender of the phone? Excuse me? Is the bender of the phone care? Whatever. Mm -hmm. 
the vendor is not interested in the operating system that runs on the phone. What they're interested in, again, is selling phones. And they're all, they're all going to have, most of the manufacturers are going to have Android. They're all going to have Windows on it. Um, there are some other operating systems, Symbian and stuff like that, that were used by the their... No, I'm sorry. I just meant, uh, do you have to jailbreak the phone in order to plug it? Yes. Yeah. It's it's called you might want to hand that over to him. The answer is no. no? Okay. Uh, my first, the first presentation tonight is, um, I'm going to talk about a low-cost tablet computer. This is essentially a Barnes & Noble Color Nook. It costs 249 bucks at Barnes & Noble. Their stock operating system <coughs> is essentially an Android, but it's a highly locked down version of the Android. Um, originally, you couldn't do much with it. You could use it primarily for reading books. Uh, they had a few apps installed. Uh, it was Wi-Fi connected. Um, they've upgraded the operating system to where the operating system on it is now they have a large number of apps. It's not open to the full Android market. Um, but a lot of people have put the full Android operating system on it. I'm going to talk some of the pros and cons, and feel free to stop me at anywhere in my presentation. OK? Um, if anybody goes to sleep, um, where's Blake? Here. You got your gun? Okay. And one warning, I do retaliate. Okay, I don't have my light pen. So, essentially, the, the basic thing is that. Um, oh, good. <coughs> okay, main thing, I bought my color note primarily as a book reader. Um, one of the real advantages, one of the advantages over the Kindle, for instance, is that it has a larger screen. It doesn't have buttons. I hated the buttons on the Kindle. My daughter and my mother both have Kindles. I like the color. Uh, it does have Android apps. It's backlit, so you can read it in dim light. So if you like to read in bed at night, and want to have don't want to have a lot of lighting, you can do it. Um, or if you're watching television with your wife and the commercial comes on, you can read. Don't laugh. <laughs> I've done that. Okay, but it doesn't do all that well in bright sunlight. So if you are going to go out on a cruise, sit by a poolside and want to read. You may want to use a Kindle or the black and white note that uses E. But that's not the objective of this. And the battery life is less than a Kindle. Uh, although I haven't had battery problems. And I took a, recently took a train to uh, Montana and um, did a lot of you know, reading when they uh, couldn't see outside and things like that. And again, please feel free to ask questions at any time. <coughs> the note costs 249 bucks, which is one of the lowest priced tablets, although somebody has a Japanese knockoff here that was 90 bucks. Ch Chinese, they said. Excuse me? Chinese. Chinese knockoff. Okay. Um, so you're saying the Kindle is not a computer? Okay. Kindle is a computer. Kindle is about half the price. Yeah. It's a single purpose. This is a color system. The black and white Nook from Barnes & Noble is, I think, about $10 more than the Kindle. Okay. Does the black and white Nook use an e-ink display? Yes. yes. Okay. 
but this also has a this also has a touch screen and everything else. Does the black and white look on it? It does run Android. It yeah, it, I'm actually I've been told, but I don't know that actually the Kindle is running a version of the Android also, but not highly locked down. Nobody, I've never heard of anybody trying to put anything on the on the uh, Kindle. Um, but essentially, the current version of um, stock color note is Froya. Okay, here are a couple of specs. Backlit, 8.1 inch by 5, weight is 15.8 ounces. Although, you can, you can buy cases like this, like I have, that protect it nicely, they add some weight to it. Um, it is heavier than the uh, Kindle. And external uh, micro. Uh, that should be a micro SD, up to 32 gigabytes. I've got a 16 gigabyte micro SD in here. And this had FOIL locked down. The stock, the stock version of the color note currently does access a market that is controlled by Barnes and Noble. It's not the full Android market. <coughs> um, <coughs> and I looked at that their selection of free apps is small, but one of the things you can do with the with the uh, stock operating system, they do have uh, certainly a web browser they have since day one. They also have um, a Gmail app and stuff like that, so that you can run uh, Gmail and stuff like that on the stock. Okay, and it has many many games, both free, most of them dollar. If you want to run Angry Birds, I believe that's a app you have to pay for through Barnes & Noble. Whereas on Android, regular Android, there is free version of Angry Birds, I think. Um, so why do I want to use a stock OS? Well, one is to preserve the warranty. And the book reader has <coughs> features that it are not available in the Nook Android app. Both Nook and Kindle have Android apps, uh, which I've loaded on my uh, my phone. So essentially, my my presentation is going to be oriented more on dual booting or multi booting. The um, Nook Color. Yes. I think that Ubuntu has been uh, loaded onto it. As a matter of fact, I'm sure Ubuntu has been on it. Um, Jesse Vincent booted Ubuntu on the yeah. yeah, but the um, but again, for as a, as a book reader, I happen to like a lot of the features of the book reader. Um, but we're not talking about book reading here tonight. Okay, what the alternatives? Well, you could run various Android versions: Foyo, Gingerbread, Honeycomb. Essentially, <coughs> um, you can run Ubuntu as we did it. I haven't tested it. You can easily uh, root the Nook Color and install any one of the above systems. Uh, but as I said, you can install systems on a micro SD card, and you can boot the stock OS with no SD card. Or you can boot from the SD card. All you do is put the SD card in and boot, and it's going to come up. 
assuming that you burn the SD card correctly. And I've put, I've actually put about five different versions of Android on the SD card before I really came up with something that I found halfway usable. Without using ADB and stuff like that. Is that what the shut down? Yeah, what's ADB? ADB is, I define it somewhere down here, it is the Android debug bridge. bridge. That's it. The ADB. And the ADB is a way that you can connect two Android devices directly from Linux or Windows. Hardware? Excuse me? Is it hardware? Software. You connect through the USB cable. And, or USB cable either to your NOC or to, to here. I, I rooted this, but I've unrooted it. Um, the methods available to do the multi-boot, um, I've put a few URLs. If you look at rooting the color nook, you get a lot of different sites, how to do it, and a lot of different opinions. Yeah. Can you describe what you mean by rooting it? Okay. <coughs> Your most smartphones, most systems come with that you are essentially a user of that phone. You, you cannot do privileged type operations. You cannot install software that has not been approved that you can't get from the market on most phones because they're locked down to some extent. You can't do development unless you somewhat root the phone. That's where you do ADB. You could answer that probably better than I can. Um, the when you root it, it you're <coughs> essentially a Linux root user. How do you do that? I mean, how, what are the steps involved in rooting? How do you get access sure. to it? To you, well, you can explain it, but the basic way you do that is there's a development mode on the Android. You turn development mode on. You connect it to ADB, and then you can use ADB to install the appropriate rooting software. Oftentimes, it involves actually exploiting a exploiting a, a hole in the operating system that allows you to get root, like yeah. a kernel vulnerability or something like that. That's typically been how it's done. Yeah, sounds like how you do it when you feel some sort of thing. Uh, Virus software to yeah same same method similar so, um, but again you're you're running a, a Linux kernel in there and once you do that you can actually install software that isn't uh, in the market mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you can write your own applications and install the application that's what that is for for some degree. Um, there are a couple of different methods to do the rooting. Um, I was able to get in, I installed, I think Mass 511 was one of the apps I wanted to install. So I rooted mine strictly to uh, install some apps that weren't available in the market at the time. Um, but I played around with developing, but I've got a lot of other things that I do. Okay, so I'm not an expert at that. Uh, there are a lot of different places that you can go to find out how to install versions of, a versions of Android on your uh, phone. One is most, most of the mods come from the XDA, XDA developers for them. A lot of those guys are the guys that actually do it. Um, another one that's popular is Cyanogen Mod. And again, they're 
essentially dedicated to aftermarket firmware for phones and do not. Uh, both of these places are, both of these are not really dedicated to Android per se. They're dedicated to others, including Android. Um, FireMod is another site which is dedicated to Android development. Um, and you can Google for a lot of other sites. These are the primary sites. I look specifically for <laughs> dual booting. I didn't really care about multi-booting. It's just that the uh, I like the FireMod. And here's a few other sites I was looking around to find. Um, dual boot your color nook the easy way. You can buy a micro SD card for $35 already pre-built for you. Um, this one here, you can uh, get dual booting Nook to Android. So there are a lot of different places you can go. And again, Google is your friend. But the simplest, the simplest way is to get a pre-built image, take the micro SD card, plug it into your PC. Uh, most micro SD cards come with an adapter you can plug directly into some computers like this. I think this way will take a micro SD. Uh, I've got another adapter that I've had for years that I just plug into USB port, which is just <coughs> this thing I picked up a few years ago. That I recognize that. That does not support SDHC, I don't think. That particular, that's, uh, I remember that one. Yeah, it does. That one does? Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm not seeing it. Then. It, it does because I believe I have an SDHC. Okay. Uh, in here. I couldn't find a, a regular micro SD around. They do make them that have well, actual them, slots. Yeah. So you're working in a fairly cooperative sense then because you're relying on some firmware to find the USB and initialize it and read your image in and so you're not, you're not blowing anything away, right? No. Okay. okay. I have a completely stock. Yep. If I take right. out the micro SD, my, my system is completely stock. Understood. So I can go into Barnes and Noble and say fix this if it's still under the warranty. Um, one of the things that I found is that if you download a 16 gigabyte image, <coughs> it will not fit on a 16 gigabyte <coughs> SD card. So now. One of the things I didn't say in here is how to copy the image to your SD card. It's very simple. Um, in Linux, you use just DD. Um, DD IF equals the name of the image. OF equals uh, the physical device slash dev slash SDD or whatever your SD card is that's plugged in. Um, and it just overwrites, completely overwrites that SD card with the image. That's the easiest, simple way. Once it's done, it's on there. I also found that the putting the 16 gigabyte image on there, or at least the 15 and a half gigabytes that I actually wrote, took hours on my. Uh, my Linux system. I found that there's a Windows program, there's a Windows 32-bit program that I had on my laptop at work that is much, much faster. So either I have, a, I might have a USB one or I've got the kernel misconfigured or something. Once you've written that image onto the flash, and this, when you're running the system, are you running strictly out of RAM or are you updating the, the Software as it's running up the you're you're running off the SD card. Is there any issue of you know the cycle 
So, and how about overall lifetime? I guess we, nobody really knows yet. No. no. Um, get at least a class six or class six or six uh, class eight SD card, or else it'll probably die within um, four or five months. So, uh, class two SD card is guaranteed to write at least two megabytes per second, uh, while class six six megabytes, and so on. Uh, and so the lower the class, the lower the quality, and it'll die faster. Especially when it's because we're running an operating system on it, it'll die sooner. Yeah. These OS images haven't been modified to not constantly be updating metadata on the disk and so on, right? Yeah. What's in the 16 gigabytes? Like, is it just? It's just an image. So, so how is the OS at all? I mean, how, how Small. I think. I think you could actually do a one gigabyte with no problem. You could do a, I guess, four gigabyte partition and copy that and then have other stuff that they have. Uh, Effectively, yeah. There, there are a couple of different ways to, to do it. Um, probably the best way do it and start with the uh, clockwork, mo clockwork mod. That's a little bit more complicated, requires the use of ADB to do some things. You've got to format a couple of uh, partitions on it, but um, you probably have a more complete system when you're done. Does the stock OS um, that comes with the unit run strictly out of RAM and not have these uh, update issues with the? That's RAM? correct. Stock, you don't need the SD card. The, the, when you buy stock color knock, you don't get an SD card. But it's a strict, so it loads from a read only yeah. image in the middle of the RAM. Yeah. I just mentioned clockwork recovery. Oh, another thing about the clockwork recovery is that you can also overclock your CPU. Uh, I didn't throw that modification in there. Um, more for time in preparing this because I had to have, I had, you know, we had started planning the meeting before uh, I went on my trip to Montana. But while I was in Montana, our, one of our servers decided to, uh, it didn't want to boot anymore. And we had all sorts of trouble trying to get a new server in there temporarily and stuff like that. With that Jabber did the most of the work there, but still it took a lot of my time and doing his presentation. So I didn't really have time to play with it a lot. So I, I took the easy route, but I did. I did initially do the clockwork uh, recovery. Um, I didn't. I didn't put up a video a picture of that. But I think I have one on my cell phone. Okay. But once the thing is with the um, this the monster root pack and stuff like that, uh, if you you have to get the zip files. If you put them in the right directories, they'll come right up. Um, and I just didn't have the time to play around with it and do the other things and stuff like that. But I think that this might be for somebody that already knows how to do development on the Android and stuff like that and really wants to work it, this might be one of the better ways to go. Um, um, ADB is something uh, we talked about earlier. Again, this is the Android debug bridge, as you say here. Um, you can download it, you can get it for Linux, uh, you can get it for Windows, and it works fine on both. I've used it from both sides. You can do ADB over the network, too. Yeah. Over TCP. I feel good. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. <coughs> And I said, I tried a bunch of different things that 
some I were okay, some I didn't like. Um, one of the things I did is I uh, tried fire mod, and that mostly is a multi boot, so you can actually have multiple kernels on your um, on your SD card, as I have on mine. And I've got some screenshots that I'm going to go through. Okay, this is the stock Nook color. Um, I took that in my office. Uh, one of the things you know here that smoke is that's Mount Kilauea. That I use as a background <laughs> in my Android devices. Um, Uh, fire mod comes up with this stupid little thing and it's got a fire going through this so it's very difficult for me to get something that where you can actually read fire mod up there okay uh, this is the fire mod this is the froyo fire mod um, And this is uh, the gingerbread. I mean, I'm sorry, this is the honeycomb, which is Android 3.0, um, which looks a lot better on my laptop. Um, but I, I found that with, with a couple of these things that I, easy ones where you just put an image on your SD card, uh, one of them, like a a honeycomb, but didn't come with market, and I had other other than using ADB, I had no way of loading any more apps on it. Of course, I could have used ADB, and if I had more time, I probably would. Have. Okay. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention in the presentation is that <coughs> when you boot this, to boot in the to boot in the standard thing, all you do is have to, your SD card's right here. All you do is pop out your SD card, and when you boot, it'll boot into the stock Android, in the stock uh, color nook. Um, if you have the SD card in, if you want to boot into, if you're using the same one I have, if you want to boot into Honeycomb, you have to hold the Nook button down until it says loading Android. And if you just boot it without anything with the SD card in, you'll get the uh, FOIA link. So here, a little bit of this is just going to be show and tell. Any questions that people have, uh, shout them out. <coughs> I kind of was, I, I got interested in the tablet uh, phenomenon because uh, they are sort of all around and not nowadays and um, it's a little bit hard to tell I, I think these days you know what really qualifies as a tablet is for instance uh, you know would you consider the Nook a tablet would you consider smartphone a tablet would you consider I guess I left my Vizio oh you know see, see the problem with these things is that they're so small it just kind of leave them lying around <laughs> so th they're um, you know, they're not exactly disposable, but I guess they are certainly losable. Um, <laughs> so, you put a curtain on it. But yeah, I mean, how many people have passwords on their device? Of, of, uh, how many people have a smartphone, actually? So, about, about, uh, about half. I have fingerprint. <coughs> so, here's one thing that's, uh, that's a little bit, that, you know, we can talk about the dirty secrets of Android, too. So, one of the criticisms has been that. Uh, that there are all these different versions of the operating system, like this, you know, 2.1 and 2.2, and, the, and, and actually, somebody asked the question about, well, what about the vendors today get to choose what goes on, and, and when can you upgrade and when can't you upgrade? The difference in, as I understand it, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the different API levels, the different versions of Android basically are different API levels, which oftentimes will support different hardware types of devices. So, in fact, 
uh, version 2.2 Froyo, it, is, is, it, it supports a certain level of API, and then things above that, like for instance, gingerbread, support additional uh, levels of the API or hardware, similar, frankly, to what uh, Apple did in the early days as it moved through different versions of the Macintosh OS, right? Um, where, generally speaking, uh, applications that would run on the lower versions, the older versions, for instance, 2.2, would run on the newer versions of the software, but they weren't backwards compatible. So stuff that is written with the Gingerbread API as a target will not necessarily run on Froyo. So for instance, I got this uh, Motorola. It was the first version of uh, a tablet that uh, supported Gingerbread, which for some <coughs> reason I thought was kind of an important thing to get. And, and uh, But if you, write, you can write stuff for this, it's got like different sensors and different functionality, things like that, that wouldn't run on the Samsung Droid phone, which is uh, version 2.2 of Froyo. So, however, stuff that is written for this phone would run fine mm -hmm. on this version of Marlboro. So one of the criticisms of Android, uh, levied by particularly, I think, Steve Jobs on, on a, um, <laughs> you know, an earnings report call, was that, well, Android, the big problem it has is that it's all, it's, it's fractured development platforms. We have all these different uh, versions of the OS. And he specifically named one developer who, what a difficult life they must have supporting all these different versions of the OS. And then that developer, is, at least as I've read, sort of the next week came out and said, Jesus, Steve, it really isn't all that bad. Um, <laughs> so, the, but there has been a criticism that there are these different versions. Uh, and, and a pretty good one is, um, it, well, it, the other thing is you get different hardware, right? So this Motorola Zoom supports 3G, which is this wireless, you know, protocol for data transfer, stuff like that, right? The Samsung Droid Charge actually is 4G. And it is fast. I mean, web browsing, it's faster than you know, the fiber optic network that's in, in my residence, right? Um, so, so, you know, supposedly the Zoom is going to be upgradable to 4G, I think. I'm told now it's going to be September. Is that right, Thomas? September 8th. September 8th. So I've already flashed <coughs> mine back to stock, waiting in anticipation. Okay, and what, so what's the deal? Yeah. So, when it originally came out, they, in all the versions and everything, they said that it was going to be 90 days. So that 90 days came and gone, and then they said they're having a couple issues, um, and they were selling them with things in boxes saying that the fourth quarter two ended. Quarter two ended, um, and so then people were talking class action lawsuit, and they got scared, and now I've got a um, three months free on here since I've played so much. So. Oh, that's pretty good. What's the technique there? Three months free for? For data usage. So <coughs> I've had free data. Oh, take, take notes, folks. This is the way to go. So, yeah. Yeah, just keep asking for a manager. So, <laughs> okay, so uh, get, it takes a couple days, but <laughs> get out of the push button menu uh, mode and talk to a real person. So, the thing, when I bought this, I bought, you know, I paid like 50 bucks less. I got a data plan. So, some of these things have either, now you can get them just Wi Fi only. The, um, the Vizio is just is Wi-Fi only. I don't think there's a 3G or a 4G, you know, there's no data option, right? So to a certain extent, what you've got, what I've got here is I've got uh, the Vizio, which and there's a TV here, which we, I didn't lose that, but uh, which we can, I did lose, oh no, there is. So what you actually can use the Vizio thing is, uh, you know, changing channels and remotes and, and things like that. So it's got an application. It's got a little, you know, infrared or whatever it is in here that, and it, sure enough, it works. You, you program it to the, uh, the model version of your Vizio TV, but I think it also works with other kinds of devices. Anyways, the point is, this is Wi-Fi only. No Ethernet, any of these things. Now, the Zoom is, um, it, it, it came with a data plan. It's got Wi-Fi, but it also has a data plan, it's got a certain level of data plan, and then I cut back to, whatever the minimal data plan is, uh, it basically is what I cut back to. So, it's it just this maintenance thing. I got this originally, the different uses models for me, you know, if you travel for mapping, for communications, for information, uh, location. I didn't at the time want to get sort of the higher end data plan all out, you know, uh, fully loaded kind of thing, just because I didn't think that I'd need it. But then eventually I did get it, and it really is, it's, 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 uh, it's unbelievable. But anyways, this has a, a, a very limited data plan, which you can check periodically at the Verizon website. This says unlimited data. I kind of got it just before Verizon cut out the unlimited data offerings. And uh, so this says Wi-Fi, as well as data, as well as um, it's got HDMI out, which is a pretty cool thing to have. So if you want to show stuff on TVs or, or what have you. Most of these devices do have <coughs> HDMI out. Um, one thing that's a real, that, that Steve Jobs, I think, would have a legitimate criticism of, all these devices, I mean, I could hand them to Jerry. It probably would take him 10 minutes to figure out how to power on maybe just one of them. 
Um, so, you know, I mean, certainly I could give them the one that would take them 10 minutes to figure out, but none of them have power on buttons in the same place. Hey, Brian, can I interrupt just for a second? Sure. A moment ago, there was a little alert up there saying your battery's about to die. Oh, okay. So you might want to uh, plug in. Thanks. That was. Uh, that actually happened to me this weekend. Uh, my, we bought a new phone for my wife. My Motorola turns on here, and it, it's got a fingerprint sensor. So I swipe my fingerprint, and it gets logged in. Her phone has a button on the right-hand side, which is where my volume control is. So hers is a Samsung. Nexus, so it can get confusing. So, and if John sees like this thing that comes up on this one that says your battery's about to die, it's actually my pacemaker. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> you jump up and down. No, but so some of them have Bluetooth. You know, you jump into the car, it automatically syncs with the you know the car system. Yep. You, you know, unfortunately, the car system is is uh, Microsoft one. But um, but you know, this, so th there's a lot of functionality in these devices. They really and truly are. I mean, they're all there's a crash. Uh, less often than Ubuntu and Linux. <laughs> the problem is the times when he hit the brakes in an emergency and it flashes up. Are you sure you want to apply the brakes? Oh, actually, you have to take it first. I was talking about the car. The reason we have a new car is because of the. Uh, well, anyways, the, the so so one problem is buttons are all in different places. Okay. The, the other thing is, um, and, and so they might know what the the sort of input controls are for Android. Basically, it has like, it's got like a home button, right? It's got a menu button. It's got like a go back button. Um, any other? Some of them Sorry. Windows. Sorry. It shows you all the panel windows. Panel windows. So those four, anything else? Primary sort of input. And then everything else typically is on under application, application control on the screen, OK? So the keyboards are all kind of you know touch typing on the screen. But you get those four main buttons, uh, give or take. And those buttons are in different places. And that would take another 15 minutes, at least, for Jerry and his wife to find. <laughs> because they're, in this case, in the phone, there actually there are four buttons. Um, <coughs> never figured out what that fourth one is, but it must be the window thing. They're, they're hard push buttons, OK? On the, um, on the Zoom, they just pop up on the screen. Actually, different places on the screen. You know, where you have to go find them. And then on the Visio, which is kind of cool, they sort of have this little light up thing on the bottom, so it's like a hybrid. It's not quite, it's not a push button, but it's not an on-screen button either. It's, it's again a hybrid. So back to the point about the, the vendors, the vendors, it's open source. They have tremendous flexibility in terms of how they define, customize, tailor the layout to meet their marketing interests, right? Uh, then typically what they do, I'm not quite sure how this happens, somebody might know, but basically when you develop, you develop on Ubuntu or some other familiar platform, and then you kind of spit out a package that you then load down as an app through the marketplace or something like that, right? Part of the way you do the development is you have a virtual hardware device specification that tells you how big the device is. What, as you can see, all these devices, which all run Android, uh, in fact, two of them run the same version of Android, even though they're very different sizes, different orientations, and stuff like that. Okay. So, um, so anyways, when we start, when we first talked about this some time ago, partly it was motivated by <coughs> Intel's going to have new chips. Let's see what we can do. And there really has been a flood of devices, but I don't know if they're any yet with Intel chips in. Not yet. They're not yet. So a little bit hard to see, but um, I'll shift. One of the things that I'm really interested in is the low power consumption on these things, right? So you know, any laptop that we have, John pointed out, the battery's running low. Um, any desktop that we have, you know, it's kind of watts and watts and watts, lots of watts of energy, right? So if you're interested in low power things that actually can do functional programmable things, where do you turn to? I think you turn to these kinds of tablets. So on the left is the smartphone, on the right actually is the Vizio. This is running a free application. It's a little hard to see here, but there's the battery indicator up there. Here's another uh, very cool thing that allows you to monitor, track, log the, uh, <coughs> the power usage of the device and the, so for both uh, <coughs> discharging as well as recharging, okay? So within Android, there's an API that gives you access to, uh, at a fine grain level, uh, the battery power management system. Really cool stuff. 
And anybody who develops on, these are the three platforms that I kind of did. Uh, we talked about this, three different hardware devices. So, so here are my application scenarios that I've kind of used this. You know, down there are a gazillion apps out there. They're just like, you know, there's an app for that, which was kind of, it's kind of the, the, the tagline for Apple almost, right? But, um, but it's true as well for Android. I don't know who's got more apps at this point. I don't know who's got better apps, but there are a lot of them. There are a lot of free ones. Seems in the limited use that I've had, typically it's like the good old days of shareware. You get a free app, you download it, uh, and you can upgrade it through for some premium version that gives you additional functionality. Oftentimes, though, they have the additional hook here where with the free apps, they'll just be pumping out uh, advertisements to you, right? Which is, is uh, you know, not bad if you're online or you've got a free data plan. It might be a bit problematic if you don't, though. I, I, I use this for web browsing. The, the other cool thing about all these devices, it's basically built into Android, although maybe um, the iOS was the first one to use it, but the, the sort of the ability to expand and shrink and move, it, where it's all yeah. touch and interactive, it's really cool. So the fact that you have a very small screen isn't always a big impediment. It's easy to navigate and get around. Which of course, you know, a couple of years ago, if you had a small device, you were really stuck looking at, you know, two point font. But that's not the way it is anymore. Uh, use it for email, it's really convenient. But, but, but you know, again, if, 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 if I had this, when I got this, I'm not sure I would've gotten this because this really does a, a, a lot of what you need, at least what I need. Um, all these devices have cameras, like galore, right? <laughs> and, and this one, I, I don't know how many they have, Frank. They got front, they got back. This one actually has three speakers. So you can get stereo this way as well as this one. <laughs> it's like, it's like it makes a difference, you know? But, but um, it's, Vizio, is, people know, anybody have Vizio TVs? Unbelievable. Vizio is one person yeah. dared enough to say that we both shop at the same warehouse. Uh, that, but Vizio is a very cool company. The guy who started it uh, was back in the good old days. He built monitors, the, you know, the green fluorescent kind of pulsing things that we hooked up to uh, back in the good old days. So he's a monitor salesman, and he, you know, and he figured out that all the good stuff's made in China, right? And so he he, he knew enough to basically take that experience. It's basically, it's kind of like a virtual supply chain for building TVs. He designs them, they spec them, and then they basically outsource all the manufacturing of them to whether it's China or wherever, the, wherever it is in the world that he can get the most cutting edge technology, the most advanced technology for the best quality and the lowest cost. It, you know, if you're in the market for a TV, we happen to get our first one at Costco. Uh, you, you, they're, they're all different sizes and shapes, right? Hard to beat in terms of, you know, they've got the internet connections, they've got multiple HDMIs. But again, it's like a virtual, they design it, they spec it, they don't manufacture it, but you can yeah. buy it. Uh, the other short story on, on uh, so I did pre-order this because they just came out, the, the Vizio tablets, um, about maybe two weeks ago, three weeks ago. A anyway, so I pre-ordered it from Costco at like 329. And, uh, and sure enough, it shipped August, what would it have been, July 18th, or I, I don't know what it was. But, um, and then like a week later, they sent me an email saying, you know, here's a credit for 40 bucks. We've figured out a way to lower the price <laughs> to get it to you cheaper. <laughs> and so, you know, welcome to the credit. So sure enough, like two days later, I get another email that said, here's a credit to your charge card. Who ever does that in this day and age, right? So I pre, well, I guess Amazon does with the, the price guarantee. Uh, and, and anyway, so this is kind of, you know, email, traveling camera, note taking, a lot of mapping, right? It's, it's if you're, we, we probably, a lot of us have GPS devices. It's good to, you know, take with you where you go, but there are different ways to, to get around these days and uh, the mapping is just so good. Uh, we talked about the hard versus the soft controls, you know, push buttons versus the swipe. People know what swipe is? Swipe, you want to explain it, Terry? Uh, swipe is a, essentially a keyboard. Um, it's a soft keyboard where you can go from one key to another without taking your hand off of the keyboard itself. So you go, let's say for me, key here down to here and you swipe over to it rather than have to take your finger off. So it's a dwell? It calls it by dwelling on it as you swipe the number one? Uh, you don't really have to dwell although you get double letters when you dwell. So yeah. you dwell for doubles. So, so it's a turn. 
Uh, so what it does is it it, 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 based on your turns, right, where you go, it's a QWERTY keyboard, you, you get a QWERTY keyboard on the thing, and based upon where you go, it's got some statistical profile of what words would be comprised of uh, selecting letters in those locations. Okay. S-W-Y-P-E. You pick them. S-W-Y-P-E. That's right. the, the name of the keyboard. It, it's... Uh, <clears throat> At least in uh, Gingerbread and in Froyo, it is available. At least on my phone, as a as just an option mm -hmm. built into it. Uh, on an earlier version of Android, when I had on my back clip, it was an app that I had to load. But it still was a soft keyboard. I could switch between and say, what you know, what keyboard do I want to use? I found that I didn't like it. I just like the regular keyboard because I that's what I'm used to. It's absolutely the only way I can keep up with texting in my kids. Because you know they I mean they kinda like, you know, but but it's it, it's it is actually for me it's probably about an eighty percent hit rate, eighty five percent hit rate. So it's accurate enough. It's especially accurate the longer the word gets, right? Because the, the more statistical probabilities that, you know, right. uh, come into play. Uh, so for some it's built in, for others it's not. But actually it becomes uh, you know, over time, for me at least, it's become the de facto way for entering text. Because you got to, you know, move through where the letters are as you're going up and down, it figures out what they are. So, uh, it makes the interaction, yeah. Uh, another good soft keyboard is Swift KeyX. Swift um, KeyX. That people might want to try. Same it. idea, or? No, it, it's um, tapping, but it, it's uh, probabilistic and better than the default one. Swift KeyX, right. Yeah. So, so the, again, you know, open systems, open interfaces, open a, you know APIs that you can program to, and, and you get these you know kind of choices. Um, for updates and versioning for the Zoom, it just says there's an update ready, right? So I guess you know hopefully you're on Wi-Fi at that time and not on your your limited data plan, and then they just they push them out, right? So um, you can do the routing and the you know this other kind of stuff, but but you also don't have to. So for me, it's just kind of like wait and see, and at some points. At some point, I'm told the Vizio is going to be upgraded to uh, is it ice cream, whatever comes after the you know the next version. It'll come along and it'll do its right thing. And the Zoom has been recently updated, um, and I'm not quite sure about the Samsung phone. Uh, development. I think someday we should you know be cool to have a meeting on just doing development on Android because it really is um, you know it's a cool platform. It's a very comprehensive development environment. It is free, it's freely available, it uses, utilizes, leverages existing tools that are open source like Eclipse for an IDE, um, and it's very powerful. Prim primarily, it's in uh, you know the Java space as your main model for developing applications, but you can also do scripting in Python. You know, they also have this native developer kit that uh, allows you to do things in C or C++ and other native environments. We talked about uh, the user interface, you know, it, it, it's kind of new, it's fresh, it's, it, it's, it is always evolving, and it is somewhat vendor specific, but if you can get past that, it's, it's um, we, we talked about doing the specs, I've got some here, and we can post slides afterwards. There are great specs out there, uh, great reviews at Slash Gear and others. Uh, I'll just hit the highlights for each of these devices. I mentioned 4G um, and, and with the phone, and it's, it's, you know, it is really fast. Uh, the Vizio tablet, one of the, the review comments in here was that, you know, if you put it up against some other device, it's not as fast. I'm not doing Fourier transforms on this kind of stuff. I'm browsing the web. <laughs> it's plenty fast for me. Uh, th another thing is that may be somewhat uh, perplexing or confusing. Not only do they, the, are the hardware layouts different in terms of where the power switches, what switches, what's hard, what's soft, but also the application selection is different. So what they stockpile the device with, is, uh, for instance, with the Vizio, it's obvious there's a remote control for TVs built into this, you know, installed on this, right? But even the way the screens are set up, they have different selections and subsets of the huge marketplace of applications. It might be, yeah. Also, the bug fix profile is different for every platform. So <coughs> some days you'll send off your email and discover that all of your plain text email is now being received by all of your friends with base 64 hard coded. And then uh, that bug gets fixed in one on one phone, but then emerges again on the other phone. 
So the good thing is being in a group like this, people will understand and appreciate if, if you're the friend on the receiving end. Um, which which just actually, made, you know, they, they had this black hat thing. Anybody go recently? But, you know, Packers Unite kind of stuff. And uh, I, the only stuff I, I, I like to go sometime, but people said basically leave all your devices at home. You know, you hear, <laughs> you hear people yes. talking about they, they, were, they have like steel cases around their wallets <laughs> so that the, the RFID cards that are embedded in there you know, don't get red and stuff like that. But uh, I, I haven't, you don't hear of too many uh, viruses or those kinds of attacks on Android. Maybe it's because uh, they fix them quick or something. I'm not quite sure. There are some. There have been some, yeah. We talked about pricing. Uh, the Vizio was 289, the Zoom was 499, and the phone was, you know, unless you're getting it with the data plan, it's it's probably useless. But um, I got it from Verizon. It didn't actually cost very much, but the data plan did. <laughs> what was the phone again? Uh, it's a Samsung Charge. The, the the new phones out that are 4G on Verizon, at least, it's a Samsung Charge. And what's the Droid? There's a lightning. Thing yeah. or Thunderbolt? Uh, Thunderbolt, yes. Yeah, yeah AT&T, which is now slower than Verizon, the uh, Atrix, of course, is 4G, the one I have. My wife got a uh, Samsung, which I believe is now called the Nexus S, which actually had a larger screen and uh, better battery. Yep. Um, that was also 4G. Yep. Uh, the other yep. one we looked at, the original Nexus S is 3G, but I think there's a follow-up that's 4G. Yeah, I think hers is 4G. So, as, as you think about, you know, a future phone to get or plan to get, 4G does make a difference. I mean, it's yeah. it's uh, it's a surprising uh, difference in the speed. Okay, so here's the big thing for me was like power consumption, right? So, so this is the the, the final pitch, and then uh, so I figured, well, you know, you gotta. Kurt inspired me here, and Steve Rona have done some stuff with this guy Sage too, on the solar powering, right? So how can I solar power uh, recharge my my uh, tablets? Because you're now at a point where you, in fact, can run these things off of you know kind of 12 volt batteries that are sort of. Uh, whereas I tried doing the same thing with Intel Atoms a year and a half ago or so, and you know when you're running at 30 or 35 watts, when you get a few things in there and a screen to boot, um, this, the, you you really can't get too far. But all of these things, uh, they have built in lots of power management stuff so that the screen's always going off, which sometimes is a nuisance. Uh, maybe there's some way of configuring it or changing it. Actually, there's an app for that. You can do that stuff. Um, <laughs> but for me, it was like, OK, what do I, I need to do to, to solar power this thing? So I'll just kind of quickly walk through the, uh, so here's the phone, and here's the, uh, the tablet. Originally, I just took the simple approach, which is to use an inverter, which is a thing that converts uh, DC current into AC current, and then just plug the AC plug from the charges right into the the inverter. Uh, um, you know that's easy, it's simple, and it works great for the Zoom because it only has an AC adapter attached to it. But the the converter you actually lose about a half an amp, and it just it really chews up energy, right? So I said let's get rid of that. And then uh, the nice thing about some of these devices nowadays is that the adapters come with, uh, it's got a little thing, you pull it out, it's just a USB plug, you don't have that, so it's just a five volt adapter, right? So, and it's DC, so if it's DC, you can just pull that thing out, and so what we have here is we have got the two, we'll get the phone and the zoom. Uh, this is a charge controller, which kind of takes the, the DC current and smooths it out from the solar panels and recharges these two 12 volt batteries that are marine cell batteries, and then here you've got a load coming off of this controller, that goes right to what that thing in the top is. It's just like a cigarette lighter out of a car. You know, seven bucks, you get them from Radio Shack. And then what comes out of that is just uh, a 12 volt USB uh, recharger, which you could plug into your car. Very handy thing to have, Amazon, eight bucks. And uh, it's an easy way to recharge these devices. So as you're looking at devices, the ability to recharge something uh, via USB, just plugging it into your laptop, it's it's slow. It takes time. It you now if you get down to how much amperage is put up from the AC adapter versus the USB connection, you might see some differences. Maybe we can talk about that. But um, Brian, have you uh, calculated what the cost, energy cost is to charge one of these to full capacity? Uh, I'm actually yeah. I actually I, um, yeah. Well, we could figure it out now. But it, the surprising thing is, it takes about eight hours. 
to charge this thing. I don't know, have you done any of this? Have you looked at this? I haven't looked at this. Yeah, to, yeah. to get a full charge on this thing. And of course, you, you know, you can never do this stuff until you had an API and software that would tell you to do it. But the, the, uh, the first slide I had up there, it's, it's really nice and you can just see. And it, it logs how long it takes mm -hmm. to, uh, to fully charge it. So, uh, you know, it, it runs, I mean, I could do the math, but it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, 0.2 amps and it runs for almost eight hours. Um, and at whatever, you know, five volts or something like that for the charging. So, like 20 cents to charge it? Or uh, I know what we, for, well, again, again, the great, the really cool thing today was, one, it was, I, today's really the first day I got this stuff working in, in you know, in its entirety with the sun out, you know. But so, I mean, I just had this one, a, a bigger panel <coughs> um, that was, that was running this thing for, So he, th this is a 100-watt panel, right, and um, hanging out my window. And this is, uh, these are two 12-watt panels. They actually kind of look about the same size, but there's quite a difference in size. And the, the uh, you know, I figured the 12-watt are a lot cheaper. It, it'd be kind of cool if you had a camper and you had, you know, probably one phone, and you're only using it for, like, one call a day or something like that, and you could charge it every three days. It would probably be okay with something like that at the back of the envelope. But for uh, for this one, I, I mean, it's 100 watts. It's you know, it's almost six amps. That it, so so 100 watt solar panel. What does it mean? It means <coughs> that for an hour in full sunlight, it generates 100 watts of energy, uh, which is a, you know a, sort of a fair amount. So uh, so like today, I just had this thing running for a couple of hours, and it produced like 25 amps of energy. Which and if you get one of these 12 volt batteries, like that goes in a boat. It's like 85 amps, and so you, you know. Uh, so, so anyways, it was free to recharge the things today. But yeah. Question: How much does that sound cost? Yeah, the economics don't really work out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so to answer his question, uh, how much is how much it cost? You know, it cost me about 600 bucks to charge this thing today. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm hoping to make it up in volume. <laughs> I, I actually did, you know, are, you, are you saying the, the panel costs six hundred bucks, or that over the lifetime of the panel is going to cost six hundred bucks per day to use it? Yeah, no, it's it's the first day costs costs more, and then it, it diminishes over time. But uh, the, you know, this panel is like two hundred sixty dollars, okay, which isn't so bad. So, so you know, especially considering that a year ago, current, I mean, you, I don't know, six hundred bucks, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, for you know this mm -hmm. stuff. And, and uh, th so they're far more efficient, they're far more, so, so I, you know, a year from now. I'm sure Evergreen has a whole bunch of <laughs> <laughs> Do Do any of your tablets have multiple charging inputs? Because I noticed th this one does, and this, this was the $90 Chinese thing. This is a nine volt adapter that plugs in, in on wall cube, and it's the standard method of charging. But they also give you um, a cable that fits into this multi-pin connector, which Amazingly enough, is the standard iPod connector, so the cables are easily available, and you take it, plug that into a USB source, and it charges at a different rate. So you have two different ways of charging depending on what you're trying to do. And I was wondering if, if any other tablets do that because I thought it was very weird. Can you use both simultaneously to charge you faster? I have not tried that, and I'm not probably anxious to do that. <laughs> given <laughs> Given what I have learned about Chinese clone tablets, as they frequently do unpredictable things mm -hmm. in, in terms of hardware design, it's amazing that it works at all. But it does, it does work. Um, but I'm curious if, if everything else is just one charge input. That's that's what I've seen. I don't know if anybody else has anything different. What, but I'm sorry, I missed it. What name brand was it? This is, well, that's a good question. Um, these are made by a, a factory in China called Eken Group. E K E N. And uh, you can buy them for about 90 bucks shipped from Hong Kong. And there are people selling them on eBay for about $100. And there's all sorts of slight variations on these. Um, but they're sold under brand names Via, Mid, uh, I don't know, there's a few under Eakin Group. Some also are by model number. Uh, the, this is like an M009S, and then there's an M009D, and then there are subtle variations as well. Um, so I'm not sure what kind of brand. The, uh, this one was sold as the ViaPad um, because the core CPU in it is made by Via. It's a, an 8650 oh, yeah. chip. So um, I guess that's why they got the name. But, yeah. um, but there's 
several different. I, I, some of these were sold through CVS for a little while under the Craig brand, uh, and then they sort of just disappeared mysteriously. There, there's another brand that I would like to sample. Is it ArchOS? And what's the name? Arcos. 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 Is, uh, you know, I don't know if there's any word on them so far, but they have different sizes and different speeds. Certainly, the other nice thing is the newer ones, and they're all like, on, you know, they're, they're inexpensive, right? Um, the, the new ones are faster than the older ones, and they typically use newer versions of Android. And I mean, it's just going to get faster, cheaper, better. Well, Arcos has been in business for a very long time. They they were the original platform, I think, for uh, Rockbox, yeah. which was uh, um, yeah. yeah. They, they originally made um, portable media players. Exactly. That and like five-inch devices with like 250 gigabyte hard drive, like yeah. old real hard drive. Mm -hmm. yeah. The good old days. Okay, I'll wrap up here. Yeah. Um, so these, are the, you know, these are the specs on. If you really want to get into how this stuff, all, all this, you know, the works, the, the the wattage and the amps, and Kurt's an expert in this. One thing that I will say that's just really cool, and you can't, sorry, read it from here, but these are all the attributes that um, of measurements of the charge controller that you can get access to either programmatically or unfortunately through a Windows interface. But uh, but it tells you, you know, sort of what the battery voltage is, what the amperage is, what the charging current is, what the solar array current is, what the load current is, what the... So again, these are the kinds of things that it's like, you know, uh, my, my kid is able to squeeze every last ounce out of the mileage in the car because suddenly it's got a gauge that tells him how many MPGs he's going. So thankfully he's looking at the MPGs uh, more than the speedometer, which used to be the only thing that you try to maximize, right? So, it's, you know, it's like shift your focus sometimes is a good thing. Um, Android development, maybe someday we'll, we'll talk more about that, and I think that's about it. So, uh, my name is Thomas Summers. I'm a 15 year old high school student and uh, work with the group here. Uh, so, um, I've been working with Android, uh, kind of hacker, backside developer. I don't do any applications or any of that stuff, but um, I have worked on a couple custom ROMs and some other development on Android for since about December of 2009. And uh, today I did bring a Motorola Zoom tablet, uh, just like Brian had, so I'm not going to talk about that a lot. But also, about two weeks ago, I did get HP's new uh, touchpad device running WebOS instead of Android. Uh, I got it for $2.99. They have a multiple discount for that. And uh, decided to plunge on that. So, what I've been working on the touchpad and the Zoom is working on rebooting and virtualizing um, operating systems. So, uh, I just use virtualizing, even though it's not uh, emulating any code or anything, it's just a CH root jail. Uh, but I'm trying to create a easy way for the average person to be able to take, say, Ubuntu or any other ARM OS and be able to run that side by side over there on their hand or your other Linux based device. So, on, you can't really see on a here, but I do have a Ubuntu terminal open on here uh, with it running inside of CH3 jail. And I was currently trying to uh, get it to dual boot, but I was having issues. It was working fine this morning, but it's not working now. It um, always happens. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, the dual boot does work. I just need to figure out what I screwed up. But right now it's virtualized on here. So up here I have on my site <coughs> on theater. I did get featured on. Um, Android Central, PC World, and multiple different websites back in March for being able to um, run Ubuntu in a CH root jail. And uh, video here. I so I my Motorola Zoom tablet um, unlocked and rooted, so, and last night I That was me, so I uh, got about 40,000 views from that, and since then I've been trying to take that and be able to make it a dual boot environment. You're running the stock OS, just executing in its root environments of the apps and libraries and so on. Or exactly. Sorry. And I've been also trying to make it so that you can mount, uh, say, USB uh, experience. So either the internal storage of the Android device, so you'll be able to access any of the uh, documents or other things that you're using in the Android, you'll be able to access them within, say, Ubuntu, and vice versa. Uh, I have had success with that with an external hard drive or a flash drive on the Zoom. I haven't been able to do that on the touchpad yet, but I hope uh, within a couple of days I'll be able to figure that out. Uh, 
Uh, what I do find very interesting with the touchpad, and since this is my first WebOS device and you may not be familiar with it, is that it is running Linux uh, 2.6 kernel. Uh, the next update is supposed to go up to the new 3.0 kernel, so who knows when that, when that is going to happen. But the really innovative part of this is multitasking on WebOS. So if you can see here, each application you have is in card. And you have just one button on here, like the iPad or iPhone. And using that button, you can go from within one app, go out, and be able to see all of your applications. If you close an application, you go up and just fling it out. It's very, very uh, intuitive. But then for people like us who like to tinker with our devices, uh, just like Android, it's very hackable. And just instead of having to root it, HP and Palm, when they originally made it, made it very easy. So you just download their SDK, and you plug into your computer, run it, and you have root access, just like that, instead of having, so with Android, uh, developers have to try to figure out an exploit that they can use to um, gain higher privilege root access on the device, and then have to package that in some easy deliverable way. Uh, and each time that does get harder because people at Google were pretty smart at figuring out how to stop that. How open is it to the allow you to actually overwrite the stock OS if you want to? Um, on WebOS? Yeah. Yes. Ooh. So that's how what I'm trying to do with uh, the dual boot. But instead of uh, overwriting the entire OS, I create a separate, uh, right now it's a 3.5 gig per gigabyte partition uh, that I have an ARM going to. Uh, I'm surprised how open they made it, because I've been using Android, like I said, since uh, 2009, and it's never that open, even though it's labeled as the big open operating system, and I still love it for that. The manufacturers <coughs> have really gotten in front of that, so Samsung, Motorola specifically, because they do block the bootloaders and sign keys, making it impossible, almost impossible to sign ROMs, uh, to be able to sign your own ROM and flash it. Um, HP just gave you keys and to your car, um, they they're not going to say, uh, you can't drive it, so, unlike uh, some of the OEMs. So I think, uh, especially since Motorola did, so Google purchased Motorola on Monday, uh, I'm hoping that will change, because Google, I hope that they're still open, to have an open mentality. Uh, what you may not know is that uh, all of the other versions of Android before Honeycomb have been part of the Android Open Source Project, but the source code for Honeycomb has not been released, and Google has said that they have no intention to do so, which is violating the GDPL, but who knows what's going to happen. I guess the Free Software Foundation is, wants to go after them, but I think that would just fail with how big uh, Google is. But I don't really know the legal stance of that. Um, so to pair these two, because in just regular use environments, uh, like Brian was showing with uh, Honeycomb, it does offer a much, much better uh, experience than tablets which aren't made to, uh, the versions of Android which aren't optimized for tablets. So it's very speedy. Offers, I don't think as good as Web OS multitasking, so you have a little button down here which opens up all of your different windows and you can scan through them. And then uh, press like maps. It has your maps. Well, I don't think that says. I mean, it's really what you'd like to do uh, with WebOS and multitasking. It does freeze the application when you go out. So, say if you're playing a uh, game or something, and you go out and uh, this, it freezes the application, which. You're doing something. Sometimes if the application developer is smart and doesn't save it properly, uh, you lose all of your data, uh, all of that saved data. But on Android, it spot, it saves it differently, which translates into better battery life on WebOS devices. But chances of you losing out on uh, what you're doing. Uh, I'm not really into the stock OSs on this. That's why I'm trying to emulate or dual boot them. So I won't really talk about that much, but uh, what I will say is WebOS is really great for your hacker, uh, person that wants to tinker and get the most out of the device, while Android is, has great user functions, uh, but
but it's getting close, uh, more closed down as time progresses exactly. So that's really all I was going to talk about. Okay. Uh, I'm sad that I can't show what I was doing. I have most of my uh, stuff on my laptop, so. Okay, so good evening everyone. My name is Vasuki Vinoda. Uh, when Jerry called me, or announcing that we will have an Android board today, I'm very excited just because that I'm having here a BlackBerry Playbook. It's not really an Android, uh, Android uh, tablet, but then uh, from last month, uh, somebody leaked out that uh, they have, they're planning for an Android player on Playbook. Thanks, Jerry. Okay. Sorry that I started with you. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> so, well, last, last month I found that uh, the Android player that's planned for Playbook is leaked out in the wild, and I managed to download it from internet. I think it's still available if you Google it and somewhere you can download that. And uh, with some instructions that I found from internet also from this website, it's called N4BB. So this guy is putting many information about uh, Playbook and BlackBerry, just because that he loves BlackBerry, I, I guess. So I managed to load m the Android Player beta. It's still a beta product, so it's not really official uh, support for, uh, from BlackBerry. And also I uh, managed to load uh, some applications, Android application that I think is really uh, important or it would be really interesting if I want to have it on my playbook because the playbook template, uh, a little bit introduction for the playbook template here. Uh, this one comes with QNX OS and it does comes with a couple of uh, applications but there are many applications that I think it's missing. One of them are Kindle. Uh, book reader, if you love Kindle, they have Google, but uh, the that a book collection doesn't even match with Kindle at all. Also, uh, other things, some games like Fruit Ninja or Angry Angry Birds, they they don't have it. And uh, Rovio, the one, uh, the company who made uh, Angry Birds, they don't even have any plan to uh, write uh, up to port it to Playbook. So it's kind of a bummer. Once I bought this, I was expecting that it will come with many applications. It turns out that it has very little application. But then when I found the Android Player Beta for Playbook, it's now I got excited again. <laughs> so the platform version that I'm using currently, this is my BlackBerry Tablet OS, uh, version 107. Rumor said that 108 updates will be available by end of September and it will contain <coughs> the official Android player. Well, it remains to see. <laughs> and the Android player beta from the information uh, that I got from here, it says that it's an Android 233, which I believe is gingerbread. Oh yeah, one thing that I know about the Android versioning, it's other than it's all desserts, it's also uh, sorted in order, in alphabetical order. So I don't remember what ABC, but then donut, uh, eclair, froyo, gingerbread, and then honeycomb. And later on, I suppose it would be ice cream sandwich? Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's trivia, I guess. And uh, uh, we'll need BlackBerry desktop software. It doesn't really need the entire BlackBerry desktop software package. I only need the driver so that my computer could communicate with the uh, tablet. And uh, Java SDK 7, also Android Debug Bridge, I think Jerry already explained before, the AGP tools. That's the tool that I will need to load uh, the APKs or the uh, Android package to the Android player here. And I also put the reference that I've got from the n4pp.com uh, in my slide here. I don't know, Jerry, do, do you plan to pro provide the slide deck available yeah. for everyone? Sorry. So what does player mean in this context? That's, um, I try to understand that better. I think it's either trying to emulate the function of Android on it, 
or it could be virtualized uh, uh, hardware so that an Android uh, OS could r run on top of the QNX OS. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not I'm not sure about that yet. Yeah. I yes. believe all it is is the uh, the Dolby DM implementation on top of QNX. Okay. Uh, <coughs> it's kind of like wine. Yeah. Kind of like. <laughs> wine. I mean, just JVM so implementation for the since all apps work on top of the JVM, um, as long as you port the JVM to whatever OS you have, you're you're good. Yeah, that's that's a question for uh, I, uh, for myself because it could be some kind of wine that emulates the function, or it could be that virtualize the hardware like Zen, right? So those two are having a uh, different architectures, I believe. So uh, what I did is to load the APK. Uh, first of all, I sideload the Android player uh, with the tool that they have is called TDBB. And I need to turn on the development mode in order for <coughs> me to uh, be able to upload the APKs on this device. And using the ATP command, such as ATP root, uh, to work on the root mode, ATP USB, therefore my uh, computer can communicate with this device through USB line. And ATP connect, uh, this IP address is uh, the default address of this device when it connected through USB, and then simply ATP install the APKs uh, file. I found uh, somewhere around 10 APKs that I think it's interesting to load and see how it works. So here's the result. Fruit Ninja doesn't work. Netflix doesn't work. Talk, <laughs> it works. And Hulu. It's installed, I can run on it, but then it's defunct. Uh, what, I, what I mean by defunct is that it requires a flash player uh, to be able to play the video collection. And Yahoo Messenger, it failed, as far as I could find. Amazon Kindle works, which is great, because that's one that I was expecting to have in this device. Also, Astro Player Nova, it's a multimedia player, it's a music player, it works on it. Angry Birds Rio, it failed. A Pepper Tower Defense is a uh, basically a, a tower defense game type of thing. It works. And Hello Cow app, it's this is the only uh, the application that I wrote. It's a five minutes of work of writing application, and only takes me five seconds to uh, try that out and then get bored. So <laughs> not nothing much work uh, doing on that. So. Uh, here is the screenshot. I think the, the rest of my presentation will be screens or screenshots. The Android player shows as an application in the uh, bottom right corner. And then... Excuse me, I'm just I'm sort of curious about your previous screen about the sure. your, your success rates. I mean, his point is, I would think, again, I'm not burdened with any useful knowledge right, right. of Android apps, but my understanding is they're basically Java apps, aren't they? And like you're saying, if your JVM port is Mm -hmm. Correct, and it's correct. I Java class uh, files. Uh, uh, what? How? Why do they fail? So, there's the Android SDK, which is almost pure Java with Android APIs, and then there's the NDK, which uses uh, low-level Android tools and stuff like that. And so, some applications, even though they don't really utilize any functions with the NDK, um, especially big companies like Netflix and place, they just in include those in the application uh, requirements and so it tries to import that and it just fails because obviously just because it has the Delphic virtual machine it can't access any low level Android functions. So uh, you know how Wine it imports all the DLL files from Windows to be able to run some Windows applications. Uh, it has trouble with some 3D graphics like games and stuff, especially the newer ones which haven't been uh, figured out how to work because of like DirectX and stuff like that has issues. Uh, yeah, although I mean I, I don't want to wrap things too, but that's sort of that's well, you're not in an emulated environment there. I mean you're actually executed in a system of trying this to emulate it. But if I want to put it simple, uh, if an application, Android application that uh, writes for 
we, we wrote an application for gingerbread, I bet if we use a certain set of uh, <coughs> function or certain set of classes that falls into gingerbread uh, collection and it doesn't so uh, comply with the previous version, then it's so not it's just a version skew issue, not because of some. That would be one explanation of that. I haven't mm -hmm. uh, dealt too much in it. When, when these applications fail, do they fail to install, do they fail to start, or do they fail in operation? Yeah. Yeah, you have a screenshot of one. I have a screenshot of those, so if I may continue. Uh, this is a stock application, a brow web browser, I believe it's Chrome browser, that uh, comes with the Android player. So it's totally similar with what we have in a Chrome uh, browser. And here is the uh, status screenshot. It says the Android version and build number right there. And here is a screenshot of the list of application that I've managed to load to this device. And Kindle works fine. I can open up my uh, book collection and I can read and it's even uh, rotating with the correct uh, when, when I put in a portrait mode and it goes to portrait mode. And this one, Angry Bird, it just says that it has stopped unexpectedly. Okay. So it's, yeah. it's extra angry. It's extra <laughs> angry. <laughs> it makes you angry. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, I saw a dead bird today. A <laughs> dead bird today. Okay, so this is uh, one sample of what happened with uh, Angry Bird. It doesn't let you run on uh, Android player, but uh, again, rumor says that they will have one zero eight version of uh, Unix OS, which will contain Android player's official release. Hopefully, they fix this entire thing so I can enjoy my tablet here. <laughs> Otherwise, it will be a four nine nine investment that's gone. <laughs> so it's worth to know. Android player does multitask. I can uh, play music. I can play the music with the Astro player uh, while I'm reading my Kindle book. Those are the two applications that work, and I can uh, try the multitasking and successfully running. So it's it's just pretty neat. I mean, I own iPad one before. Three months later, I sold it to my friend because just because I don't like it, it doesn't really multitask that well uh, to my belief. So this, this is pretty neat to me. And another note is that it needs, from end user perspective, from my perspective, it needs more seamless integration with Playbook. Uh, it could be launch Android application uh, from the main Playbook screen, which would be really neat. And uh, Playful keyboard and Android keyboard. That's one funny thing that I found is that when I fire up the uh, wait, okay. when I fire up the browser, the web browser in it, and then I try to type in it uh, when I touch <coughs> on the address bar, it shows up Android keyboard. But then uh, Playful has its own way to show up its keyboard. So I slide it swiping from the bottom left corner, and then it shows up uh, the Playbook keyboard. So they have two keyboards that can run all together, but this actually doesn't really work that well on uh, the Android player. So it, it could be confusing for uh, <coughs> end user just like me. <laughs> also, download application from Android Market. That would be something that's really neat if it can be done from the Android player because otherwise I will have to locate for or I will have to download an APK or write my own APK and then load it with ADB uh, application. So it's really not something that the end user will be looking for. What yes. you can do is um, just Google Amazon Markets a, um, APK and download that because that will provide an Android market like experience. I see. Can. Oh, so you can download the APKs from the Google? Yeah, because uh, Google wouldn't allow Amazon. It was Google's 
I'm sorry. Amazon's market was on the Google market for about a day before uh -huh. Google removed it because they were ticked off that uh, Amazon was making a competitive market. Oh, so they so, tell the APK? So you just oh. go to, um, just Google the that and right on Amazon's site, they let you download the APK. Oh, wow. That's cool. That's good to know. Maybe yeah. I should try that. There's only about, I last I checked, about 50,000 apps compared to the markets, 200,000 right. apps, but still 50. Well, it depends. I, I don't really think I will need more than a hundred apps in my time there. <laughs> 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 it, it is possible also to install the Google Market APK onto that. The it, problem. It's a bit difficult. The, 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 there are two issues. One is the licensing because they want money for that from the manufacturer, so that it right. probably won't be part of the playbook. Although I don't think they'll care about end users. And the other is that the marketplace application has to identify itself to the marketplace server which is what Thomas was, uh, was discussing uh, in the difficulty of um, sort of basically faking something else, claiming to be like a Nexus S or whatever, which is how this does it. Yeah. Right. Um, I think Especially because it's a, uh, not emulator, but it's uh, faking that it's Android. Uh, well, what it, all it does though to the marketplace, it sends a couple of strings. Well, yeah, yeah, I know. It's, I did that with, it was a Sonic G tablet or something. Same idea. Yeah. Okay, so I started writing uh, Android application, and this is the one that I mentioned. It only takes me five minutes to write, five seconds to play with it, and get work. So if any Android developer here, and you might wanna, uh, you wonder how your application would load on this Android player, I'm happy to uh, help you. All right, thank you. I think thank all right, so this is a company that Brian turned me on to. And as you can see, um, you just plugged in. Did you want this screen? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is called, uh, as you can see, this product is not available yet. I got a dev board. Um, um, they, they make, there you go. Okay, so they make a dev board. It comes in parts right now because they got a 12 volt power supply, but they want to go to a 5 volt power supply. Everything I got right now runs off of uh, USB 500 milliwatts. Um, I've got uh, you know some of you stick around after this. I can show you some of some of the stuff I'm running, which is powered off of on-the-go cables, and I'm using it for network too. So I've got these little clusters that are all 5 volt DC. I got these hubs that I'm daisy chaining, so I got a 64 port USB hub that I'm running my panda board cluster off of. And it's all five volt all the way up and down. So uh, this is the best screen I've gotten so far. Uh, I don't have, um, they said they'd send me the Android SD card. They sent me the, the uh, Ubuntu SD card. And for for those people who love hanging around, like uh, Federico, Federico loves hanging around in U-Boot, this, this is the platform to, <laughs> So what they've done differently is, is when you get into U-Boot and start setting up all your boot devices and, and uh, where it's booting from, their kernel isn't called U-Image, it's called U-Image Uncache. And I can't seem to change that to save my life. So, uh, but uh, but this, this, um, this dev board has a lot on it because they're trying to hit multiple markets. They're trying to get the, um, uh, the net top market with, with various uh, not just Android and Ubuntu, but you know, the Chrome OS and this is a new architecture now that's going to make that easy. Um, and they can I can get in and show you, show you, this is, uh, show you what we like. What I, what I like most about this platform is it's, it's a lot like the Panda board. It's an ARM Cortex A9, but it's 2 gigahertz. There's nice DDR2 RAM on it. I mean, it, it, it's really progressing along to where we can start using this for high performance computing. Um, that's what I'm looking at it for. This particular dev board, because they want to have a dev board that will serve many masters, is um, uh, it's got uh, it's got Wi-Fi with uh, a couple of different antenna mount points, um, gigabit Ethernet that probably won't survive the cut. They, they, uh, when they decide, when they hit their, their target markets, New Front is going to come out with a bunch of brands that are called New Smart 2 models. So, so one of them will be uh, 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 
chopper bar form factor, one of them would be a tablet. A lot of this stuff's gonna go. Um, it's got SAT on it right now. It's uh, got uh, the ARM embedded GPU MOLLE, which we can't do in HPC, we can't do much with the MOLLE GPU right now. The TI GPU that's on the Beagle board and the, and the Panda board is a uh, Imagination Technologies, uh, yeah, PV, Power VR. SGX 535 or 540. Now you can do quite a bit with that. They've got a, you can download an OpenGL ES SDK from their, from their website. Ooh. Great graphics. There's a couple of YouTube videos with Fitech. Fitech has the, the Power VR demo. Uh, really nice tool in there. Uh, you know, they're kind of the links. Um, Is that OpenGL right only in pre-alpha developer NDA sign a zero dollar PO kind of state. Uh, but uh, if you want to go old school and do GLSL and do some matrix math and, and OpenGL, you can do that. That's kind of what we're doing. We're right now we're getting halfway decent per performance out of our out of our Panda board architectures because they have neon extensions and, and so do the old ARM Cortex, mm -hmm. ARM Cortex A8 guys, the Beagle board, the gum sticks. There's some very interesting stuff on the gum sticks. You can buy a, a gum sticks that has has a, a power VR GPU on it and get halfway decent performance. And they're really small and hard to work. Yeah. Can, can you take a step back and provide a little context here? It sounds like you're talking about some type of HPC cluster. <coughs> Is this a uh, um, power efficiency play or what's going on here? Yeah, uh, power efficiency. So, so like this is rated at two watt. This this dev board. So I'm really bullish about what the final product will be once they start pulling out some of these. Uh, so it, it's performance per watt, not. Watt. That's right. That's right. So by any standard, crappy raw performance, absolutely. Um, but right now, the top of the green 500 is Blue Gene Q, and that's at 1.7 gigaflops per watt, and we're at 1.3 gigaflops per watt. In, in nowhere near the quantity that you get with an with a, I, I mean, blue jean. To get on that list, you have to have raw performance of 300 gigaflops. And we're doing Wednesdays and Tuesdays right now. So my goal is to build a cluster that will at least make it up to the 300 gigaflops level. And then we'll be able to figure out what our what our aggregate power usage is. If it scales linearly, it'll be pretty good. So what type of network architecture? So right now we're using this on-the-go uh, on cable. You get U USB zero when you plug it in. It just it just creates a device called USB zero for you. And you can get, uh, at least on paper, 480 megabits per second out of, out of a USB net. And you run a router in software? Uh, so, uh, yes. Now, uh, why I pause there is we're not getting anywhere near 480 megabits per second right now. And most of the boards also without protocol over that, but right, right. And we also to keep the power usage down on most of these embedded boards, they don't give you gigabit Ethernet. You're at fast Ethernet. That's one of these combined SMSC things that you get USB and and, and Ethernet out. So you, so we've got latency problems in addition to low bandwidth on, on those on that side. Um, but for the applications that are CPU bound and to a lesser extent memory bound, and that's like two out of the seven benchmarks we have to run, it's it's very promising. And uh, who is we? Uh, th this is what I do at my lab at MIT. Is we, we uh, and primarily um, embedded ARM architectures. I probably have eight different variants of this. Everybody's got their own U boot. I thought at least U boot would be the same, but they're all doing their own U boot. This is a very uh, Packed up kernel that they put together for this Ubuntu, and I still don't have. Like I said, they did send me Android, but I still don't have that working yet. And that's another uh, odd implementation. I thought would be able to. You have to go. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have. Um, <laughs> I don't have Angry Birds, but I got mines. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I just wanted I, I wanted to have this up here so you could see what you know the development. What, we have a couple of other development platforms. A lot of these companies that are OEMs too to some of the uh, chocolate bar manufacturers. They they sell uh, dev kits, Fitech sells a dev kit for like 500 bucks and it's got all these. If you, if you really need wireless, this is a pretty good architecture to work from. Uh, the, the targets we're looking for are, are really much more stripped down. We don't, we don't need all the other chipsets. Um, a, a, good, a good embedded GPU, yes. Um, 
after that, you know, that uh, is, is, uh, is good audio on there. And, uh, so, so I'm pretty sure they'll come out with, uh, and I know TI is very interested in that, some sort of stripped down, streamlined model that'll get, you know, it'll, it'll run under a lot. We bought these, I'll show you some of the pictures later. Um, in fact, I, wanna, I have to put together a slightly better presentation for next month and I'll, I'll have that available. Um, we're running some of these off of, you know, those, those uh, batteries that you can buy to, to recharge your, your nano, your iPod nano. So we strung a couple of those together. Somebody sells them at Swap Fest and, and uh, we're getting, uh, they're rated at, at, you know, a half a watt, but, but you can put them together and get two watts out of it or something. So, so we're running it off a battery too. So we're, we're kind of cooking the books on the performance per watt ratio. But, uh, but we'll, we'll try to capture all that. I've got a lot of, uh, I've got a lot of meters and lots of meters and what, so we can figure out what our performance <coughs> per. Is there some kind of overall price, like the first one, the first uh, denominator in space? Or no, no, th no, there's just a, this kind of one. Is so the easy? top 500 list is all the supercomputers at, in peak performance. And then they remix that and they generate the green 500 list and that's yeah. a performance per watt. So all the real big heavy hitters at the top of the list have their own nuclear plant outside the front gate. <laughs> you know, like, like yeah. Oak Ridge has two of the spots, right? So um, <laughs> we hope to at least get into the list at, at that sort of like basement level where, you, you know, to get to get on the list you have to add like, you know, to, you know, the 300 gigaflops entry level. And right now, so we're getting 3.1 gigaflops single precision out of our panda boards, which is the best we've done so far. We hope to do slightly better with this since it the clock rate on this is better. It's, a, it's the same ARM licensed core as the Panda board. It's just got a, a faster clock speed and uh, a little bit better RAM. I think our RAM speed is a little better. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm very, very happy with some of these dev kits that are coming out. And the, and the, the timeline, you know, Newfront was hoping this would compete with the next generation Tegra. And uh, NVIDIA's got a very aggressive Tegra uh, Three Cal timeline. Yeah, the Cal Alex. I think that's shipping already. No, uh, it's end of October. And the ST Erickson has uh, the first of the next generation ARM architecture, the eight ARM Cortex A15. Uh, ST Erickson has that coming out uh, probably early next year too. They, they've announced it on their website. And that's gonna get spectacular performance. Um, 210 gigaflops per, per watt, uh, according to their press release, which is almost <laughs> certainly wrong. Because if they don't if they don't have hardware yet, I'm not sure where they got that figure, but it's on it's on the website. But, yeah. but that's single pro that's for one. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, you yeah. Gotta get them talking to each other. We sure do. And and, and USB net gives us some good latency things and I think the next generation if we can actually get what it's spec'd at, if we can get the four hundred and eighty megabits per second, that's that's getting us there. <coughs> we're we're not in the big league with the with the you know, even Diggy or, or InfiniBand, but uh, but if we can get some combination of low latency and high bandwidth or half decent bandwidth, possibly on two different rig connects, that's that's going to be that, that's going to be worth the solution. What type of network topology yeah. will you use? Uh, so I, I think right now we're just doing uh, because because we're doing short numbers, it, it's going to end up being some sort of fat tree. Uh, right now we're just just buying bigger switches, so it's all flat right now. So there are USB switches that all. Uh, there aren't right now. No, we're we're doing USB hubs right now. So that so yeah so that that doesn't scale very well either. <laughs> but we're only doing our biggest our biggest cluster is 16 nodes, so it works for that size. So maybe next time I come, I'll have the Android firmware with on or the uh, the Ubuntu combination. Angry Birds, most important. Yeah, I gotta get Angry Birds. <laughs> Maybe I'll have a virtual right, right. Angry Birds. We're <laughs> running faster than the Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Oh, okay. okay.